All inside ACL reconstruction with locked bucket handle lateral meniscus tear. Our current prefer technique. A 24-year-old patient presented with complaints of pain and instability that have persisted for four months following an injury sustained while playing football. Even though there was a noticeable limitation in extension, but patient experiences pain when pressure is applied, suggesting the presence of a locked bucket handle meniscus tear. The clinical examination revealed that the Lachmant and the anterior drawer test did not produce positive results. This outcome is attributed to the presence of a locked bucket handle meniscus tear. MRI findings support the diagnosis of an ACL rupture with a displaced lateral meniscus tear. A graft was harvested from the superficial quadriceps and formed into a quadruple graft with a length of 65 millimeters. The graft was found to have a diameter of 10 millimeters for the femur and 11 millimeters for the tibia. Our design for the all inside ACL reconstruction graft includes 15 millimeters implanted in the femoral tunnel, 30 millimeters intraarticular, and 20 millimeters anticipated in the tibial tunnel. An adjustable button is placed at both ends of the graft. The goals of ACL reconstruction are to prevent anterior translation, ensure a robust reconstruction, and facilitate quicker rehabilitation. Additionally, ACL reconstruction must inhibit rotational instability. To achieve these objectives, our strategy involves, first, using a short but substantial and strong graft. Second, the reconstruction direction is kept more horizontal rather than vertical. A more horizontal graft angle is expected to not only prevent anterior translation, but also provide better anti-rotational instability effects. A vertical graft angle might only prevent anterior translation. This is achieved with an oval-shaped and low position of the femoral tunnel and an anterior medial placement of the tibial tunnel. Standard anterolateral and anteromedial portals were created. An ACL rupture with minimal remnant was observed. A displaced bucket handle tear was noted on the lateral meniscus. Evaluation of the medial meniscus showed it to be intact. The strategic sequence for these conditions involves first performing the femoral ACL tunneling, then repairing the meniscus, and finally tunneling the tibia. Femoral tunneling is performed first as it requires deep flexion. If femoral tunneling is done after repairing the bucket handle meniscus, it could damage the post-repair construct during deep flexion. We used a 7 mm offset femoral guide. The insertion of the K-wire was performed in deep flexion and confirmed to be in a low position. After K-wire insertion and button drilling, graft drilling is done gradually. This approach has two advantages. First, it helps avoid posterior condyle fracture blowout by evaluating after each drilling. If it is too close to the posterior condyle, the wire can be adjusted more anteriorly, as per our published technique. Second, gradual drilling allows the creation of an oval tunnel. An oval femoral tunnel covers the footprint of both ACL bundles, providing an anti-rotational effect similar to the double bundle technique. Moreover, an oval tunnel ensures more extensive graft bone contact, believed to enhance healing. The technique for achieving an oval tunnel during sequential drilling involves positioning the drill entry from the anteromedial portal closer to the patellar tendon. The depth of the femoral tunnel itself is 15 millimeters. Following this, a single limb passing suture is inserted. As observed, the formed femoral tunnel is oval rather than round. Next, the bucket handles lateral meniscus tear is repaired. Such cases are particularly challenging due to the mobility of the lateral meniscus. If possible, we avoid using implants for meniscus fixation fearing implant detachment during patient mobilization. In this case, the initial step was identifying the tear shape and debriding fibrotic tissue. Trephination was performed using a K-wire to refresh the tear site, promoting bleeding and stimulating better healing. The zip principle was applied to reduce the tear from anterior to posterior. 
Inside-out sutures for meniscus body were placed using joint-specific instruments, followed by insertion of several sutures to reduce this part. Subsequently, with the help of an introducer, the reduction of the posterior horn tear was maintained while inserting several all-inside meniscus suture implants. During the tightening of the all-inside meniscus suture, we first identified the suture closest to the free limb. The free limb was pulled and the moving loop was identified. A probe was then used during gradual tightening to ensure balanced pressure or force on both suture loops, resulting in more stable fixation. To fixate the posterior horn of the meniscus, the viewing is shifted to the anteromedial portal to allow for a better instrument trajectory through the anterolateral portal. After fixation, a re-evaluation showed that the bucket handle pattern was due to a tear from the posterior horn, so the reduction suture on the body will be removed. Slight flexion and extension movements were performed to mold the meniscus. The viewing is then returned to the anterolateral portal. The third stage involved creating the tibial tunnel. Our ideal tibial tunnel position is more anterior and medial, resembling the native ACL footprint. The anterior position landmark is aligned with the anterior horn of the meniscus, but behind the anterior intermeniscal ligament. The medial position landmark is the tibial eminence, with the tunnel expected to be lateral to this eminence without damaging it. We opted to use the ACL guide elbow type. After inserting the wire at the desired tunnel point, the button drill insertion follows, serving as pre-drilling. Next, a 4.9 mm retro reamer was inserted, and its blade matching the graft size was opened and positioned near the bone. The tibial tunnel length was measured. The graft in the tibial tunnel is expected to be 20 mm, with an additional 3 to 4 mm for graft tensioning. We consistently remove bone debris after drilling. This practice is expected to reduce post-reconstruction inflammation and patient complaints. A single limb suture was then inserted. Both single limb passing sutures were joined and extracted through the anteromedial portal. The double limb suture was then passed through the femoral tunnel, followed by the graft passing sutures. The camera was moved to the anteromedial portal to visualize the button's entry and passage through the far femoral cortex. After flipping the button, the camera was returned to the anterolateral portal and the adjustable suture graft was tightened. The double limb passing suture to the tibia was followed by graft passing. Pretensioning was done while avoiding deep flexion due to the meniscus repair. Subsequently, the adjustable button suture was tightened in full extension, a position proven to yield better full extension outcomes for patients. Lack of extension post-ACL reconstruction can make it difficult for patients to stand and walk properly, negatively affecting the final clinical results. The extension button was then placed on the tibial button. Again, we performed the tensioning in the fully extended position. Subsequently, knotting of the suture is performed to secure the fixation. An impingement evaluation was performed. No graft impingement was observed in full extension despite the anterior tunnel position as this ideally represents the ACL footprint. There was also no graft impingement on the femoral condyle due to the medial position of the tibial tunnel, creating a more oblique graft angle. This positioning avoids impingement 
and provides better anterior translation and rotational instability prevention. The tourniquet was deflated and intraarticular bleeding was controlled. Gentle massage was performed to expel residual fluid. Minimal effusion post arthroscopy indicates early outcomes of minimal pain and better range of motion mobilization. One day after the surgery, the patient exhibited no complaints related to quadriceps strength and was instructed on tiptoe weight bearing mobilization. One week post operation, the patient exhibited no issues with knee extension strength. We also advised the patient to begin weight bearing without crutches.